So maybe we can start. And thank you very much for the staying in this room. I'm very surprised. I was really afraid of that. Uh, that all of them are <laughs> going to downstairs. <laughs> so the, by the way, my name is Michio Honda from NEC Laboratory Europe, and uh, the working with uh, some former colleagues and uh, the, my the permanent permanent or some usual colleagues. The, this is basically the work on for the in the world of persistent main memory. So what's the implication for networking? So the, let's start from some overview. And so the persistent memory, also known as storage class memory or non-volatile main memory, uh, they are emerging, actually coming. So HPE already ships some standardized NVDMN, which is uh, some DRAM backed by battery. So the, we can make data persist on top of it, but with the speed of DRAM. That is the one kind of, say, speed optimized NV RAM or persistent memory. But on the other hand, there's a lot of other, uh, the PM character, whose characteristics is different. For example, Intel 3D cross point, so which is slightly slower than DRAM, but capacity is huge and price is expected to be cheaper than DRAM. So it is also still the put into your server DIM slot. So this is actually fundamental change in memory hierarchy. So the CPU cache on top and the disk in the disks in the bottom. So it is basically two, three orders of magnitude faster than SSD, so disks. And so more importantly, or equally importantly, that we can access to persistent tire or data using unprivileged load store instructions. So this is the, in contrast to disks and SSDs which we need the system core to access persistent data using at not byte granularity, but the block granularity. So the, in, the sto in the storage community, a lot, lot of work is going on. For example, the, so today, so for example, data structure on file systems are mostly designed to organize how to organize uh, the block granularity data, but uh, the on persistent memory, the we can access data in byte granularity, so the random access is much the, the convenient and fast. So this talk is about what the impl implications for networking. So let's take a look at the example of end-to-end -end transaction. So just very simple data exchange between client and the server. So the client, say, sends some data to the server over the Ethernet. Say, I want to store this data persistently, durably. Okay? Then the data arrives at the network stack, and application typically runs this kind of code, basically the looping around e pole wait and reading data from the socket and writing this data to some file using, uh, or if some file is already M mapped, then the doing mem copy. Then the, the we have to call F-Sync or M-Sync uh, to make sure data is actually written back to the disks or SSD. Then the application the write response to the socket, say, hey, your data is safe. I can recover your data even after I crash and reboot. Okay. This is uh, the basic the mechanism how today's say, durable write happens. So this process, actually, so this is the right and F-sync, M-sync, this part takes, say, one, more than one millisecond in the world of disk or SSD. So there's nothing to do with networking, okay? But in the world, so on the other hand, the networking path says that if we don't write data, then the in round trip between client and server, even including some simple HTTP logic, it is only 40 microseconds, okay? So in this world, we have nothing to do with networking. But uh, the, if we have persistent memories that attach to dim throat, so this part, writing data, so we don't need F-Sync, M-Sync anymore, we can just use CL flash instruction. And this takes only two microseconds. So now, the, for end-to-end -end transactions, the driver writing data, so bottleneck is networking. So you may think this two microsecond is a B, uh, two microsecond is nothing, so the, we, can still, we may still say nothing to do, but it is actually not. Because in the real world, the, the, it looks like this. 
So we have a lot of clients connecting at the same time, and the EPOL wait or typical server program looks like this. So on each CPU core, server runs, uh, thread runs EPOL wait, uh, into loops and process each uh, TCP connection. Then the reading data, the writing data, and process uh, sending acknowledgement back to the client on each file descriptor. And uh, the here, um, the, this process is serialized. So in the end, we have uh, a lot of latency throughput or transaction per second decrease and latency increase. So the, don't worry about between some light gray and dark gray <laughs> bars or boxes. Just compare between white bar or boxes, which is like, uh, in the case, we don't pass this data. Or let's take, say, that this is that gray box or bar, so we significantly reduce throughput and increase latency as we have more number of concurrent TCP connections. Okay. So the, here is the problem. So the, these days we have seen a lot of the improved TCP IP stack, so the, let's see some status quo. So what's going on the today? So the, for example, like uh, most recent Linux one is a message zero copy. So we can do like, we can avoid data copy, but we itself, we cannot batch system call that well. Uh, but we can still use Linux TCP IP, but the, we don't have packet uh, be placed on name of the packet area or persistent memory directory. So uh, we have to, s we still have to copy data from the, some DRAM to persistent memory. So kernel connection multiplexer. So we can call, we can batch system call across many TCP connections, but uh, the we cannot do zero copy and still the packet buffers are on DRAM. So DPDK and user space stack is the uh, biggest problem is they don't have a good TCP IP implementation. Right, so the what the paste is our system that trying to solve is the we wanna uh, the s meet all of these requirements. So the let's uh, the see the how it works. It is easier than going straight to implementation. So just uh, the imagine like uh, the user space and the kernel space, and we have NIC and we also have packet buffer, which is statically allocated and index. So the point is, we have packet buffer on the persistent me memory backed file, the slash mount <laughs> non volatile memory packet buffer. Okay, this is just a normal file, but uh, the XFS or X4, which support DAX, uh, the direct access extension for persistent memory. Okay. So the to have uh, to process packet against protocol stack, we just do the exchange packet between this special packet buffer and Linux TCP IP. And but application actually read the data, uh, access data on this packet buffer without data copy using NetMap API. So the. Then the writing data, so application, then the have to keep data. For example, I want to keep this data. So to do that, uh, the application write down metadata entry to another private file. Okay. So private this file it looks like so say it's located in slash mount non volatile memory my application metadata. Okay. So this metadata since uh, the, this is a zero indexed array, so it just keeps uh, it just keeps uh, buffer index zero, uh, buffer index one, three, one, zero, one, three, right? So the, it is basically specify extent of each buffer, okay? And after writing this metadata entry, the application have to the flash this data buffer because uh, many of you already know about DDIO, say, which DMS data not to DRAM but to last level cache, cache. So we have to the write down data. So let's go in a bit more animated way. So imagine that the, the server received four, four requests, each contained in single packet and a single TCP segment. And the application first reads this data and the TCP IP process this packet, okay? Then the application uh, identifies this data, for example, it has to write 
uh, uh, the passage directly, right, to a file, then the, say it was a set operation for key value store, okay? Then the application write this metadata entry, say I wanna store a packet buffer, packet buffer zero uh, from offset 100 byte and for a length of 1185, okay? Then the, it flashes this metadata and packet buffer, okay? This is the process how to durably store data. So the we process the, the second packet, second request segment um, in the same way. And imagine that, so the third packet was idempotent data, so which is a get operation for key value store. For such a data application, simply skips uh, the metadata entry write and also, it skips flashing metadata. So the, the let's go into the implementation. The cool thing is that we can do that without modifying Linux kernel. That's really good. So the the point is we do zero copy packet I/O to and from the persistent memory back to file, and we also take the, all the best practices from literature about how to do high performance network stack. So the, the, this is the how the initialization steps happens. So application first create some files, say slash mn slash mount pmm foo, uh, the, oh, uh, actually the, the data reside here, and application just open an mmap, that file, okay? And then the application uh, do nm open, which is some of the net maps, some the descriptor open operation. And point is, this previous m mapped mapped the virtual address of this uh, the persistent memory region. So the so the using paste extension to net map, the this nm, NM open also passes this virtual address to the kernel. Okay. Then the in the kernel, uh, the it obtains the kernel pages using get user pages uh, from this virtual address. Uh, this is ex exported to the outside of the main kernel. And then also the initializes some netmap related object like rings and some buffer uh, uh, organization. For example, the splitting this region to fix uh, to fix to the 2k buffers, 2 kilobyte of buffers. So the the important thing is the, the in netmap, rings really don't contain buffer, it only contains the point at the buffer. So the, in the, for example, in this part, so the number nine is content, number nine is content here, which means, so this is, by the way, zero indexed array, so the number nine points ninth packet buffer. In the same way, this number one points just means uh, the one first, actually zero index first, uh, the packet buffer, okay? So these are not really packet buffer. Packet buffers are all here. So uh, to use TCP IP, uh, application just use normal socket API, like socket, bind, listen, accept, and connect for control pass. So the Point is, packets are coming from the NIC to the ring, then the, this data must be processed by the network stack, Linux network stack. So on receive pass, it simply put uh, the build SKB on receive the packet buffer and put uh, the push it into the net I receive SKB. Then we also modify socket the data ready callback so we can intercept uh, the ready to read the data, say in order TCP segment at the at the socket uh, to move uh, to we, we can intercept that data, so that we can simply move the, the this data to the the user space mapped ring. When sending data, it is just opposite. The user space fill out uh, the TX ring and the push, so in the paste, uh, it pushes each data to kernel send page and we can intercept packet at the bottom at and do start xmit. So, oh yeah, this is just not, but uh, the each the ring the contains packet across multiple TCP connections. So now the, in a bit more detail how it works. 
So the when application executes some poll system call on the netmap file descriptors, it brings packet into this nickling mapped netmap ring. Say the we just got packet f uh, the on packet four packets on from ring from buffer index one to four. Say we have this uh, the four packets now. So these packets are the throw s throw into net SKB and we intercept this packet at SK data ready. Okay. So this is in the so the next so this is the okay packet buffer one to four are identified to be uh, to be read by the user application so the, it is moved to user space okay so the kind in the user space ring it is both head and tail are pointing this part so which means nothing to read from between head and tail. Okay, so once uh, the data is moved, then the kernel also moves tail here, so which means the user can read the data from here to here. Say, user is allowed to read buffer one, two, three, four, okay? So this is the process in this part, actually. So the in this for loop, we mean consuming packet from head to tail, you can see in the code, right? So the, the point is that the, this for loop just traverses the uh, ring, and if the application identifies this packet buffer translated from the buffer index is the right request, then the, the it must uh, uh, the move the data away from the ring, which is uh, the mangled by the paste or net map. So we do this uh, swap buffer index, okay? So I'm gonna explain detail later, but it basically the moves packet away from the ring, okay? So the, uh, so data is now the in flashed into the buffers, and so this they are in injured uh, to be durably stored. Uh, okay. So basically this is how it works and this is very easy to use, um, but uh, I will go back to the explanation about how to use NetMap API later. So the challenge is basically, and uh, as you see, the basically we are creating kernel module and having packet buffers and the, the sharing that packet buffer with the Linux users, uh, Linux TCP IP stack. So this is where most difficult. So for example, the TCP IP stack always calls the uh, underscore underscore K3 SKB. So the, but uh, the many of you know, the bumping up reference count on SKB doesn't work. So we have to exp we have uh, to bit or everything, or we have to use get, uh, get page for our own packet buffer to survive underscore underscore K3 SKB. So detecting packet buffers released by the stack is also difficult because uh, in particular in you know, Rx case or Rx case, uh, so basically the owner of the page or actual packet buffer space is us. So we have to know that w for a particular buffer, uh, the nobody or a stack doesn't have reference there anymore. Okay. So the but the problem is, so basically we rely on SKB TX div zero copy, which is also used by the send, uh, send message uh, uh, zero copy version. But uh, the we can't use that on receive pass because SKB often on NetApp receive SKB core, they already inbox this data, uh, this callback. So the, uh, so it uh, already execute our callback. So we have no idea what happens on that buffer anymore uh, in IP or TCP stack, in IP or TCP implementation. So in the end, uh, the we ended up with using two level destructors. So we fa on receive pass, we first set uh, SKB destructor and that callback actually set net SKB TX tip zero copy and uh, the another callback. Uh, okay, so then the, so that we can know the, this, uh, this new callback is uh, fired in, actually in the top of TCP implementation <coughs> to mark some packet, hey, this, this data buffer is free. So, uh, yeah. 
So yeah, this is basically the basic mechanism of how to share, but the, the point is we use the two levels of callbacks, like right, using SKBuff callback and SKB data path callback, which is for normally SKB TX dev zero copy. So the, maybe the, in principle it is pretty possible using the other APIs like KCM or uh, maybe AF packet version four, but uh, the problem is uh, I personally think uh, the managing buffers for zero copy is very, very hard. So of course we can do some zero copy for normal read and write, but it uh, complicates the uh, buffer management actually. So NetMap API is actually native shared memory API, so it, it is very easy to uh, move data, say, between NIC and other parts the, in a simple way. So look at this code. So this is basically how the API works, including the moving packet out of the NIC link without data copy. Oops. So the, this is, again, the so reading buffer from head to tail, and this is the part, uh, this actually translates buffer index to the actual buffer pointer. Then the application examines data to see whether this is read request or write request, for example. Then the, we can also claim packet buffer from NetMap, um, uh, which are not associated with any ring. So we can take that, uh, we can take that buffer, okay? This is actually throat, but the, the, we can take that extra buffer, which is out of the ring. So the, then the, we can flash this uh, the data. Um, this is CLC, CLC stand for cache line size. So we can, here, this is the part where we swap, uh, we move data out of the ring and set buffer index of extra buffer uh, into the current slot so that the uh, net map in the kernel side use this slot or this buffer index next time. Right, so now that we are going to maybe the most interesting part of our performance. So the, this test, the, we, the client uh, continually sent one kilobyte of write request over HTTP post, and the server uses a single, single CPU core uh, using the, the Xeon the E5 CPU, and we also use for persistent memory, which is from HPE and eight gigabyte, which is the only available persistent memory so far. So the, you may see something behind. This is the dark gray box and bar, but don't worry about that. Just to see dark gray and <laughs> light gray part. So we see the like 40%, uh, about 40% performance improvement. So depending on number of concurrent TCP connections. And we also see a lot of the latency reduction. And this is pretty useful. So the conclusion is basically uh, we are uh, the working on PACE, which is the extension to NetMap or new networking interface for high performance message oriented workload, uh, which involves uh, the persistent memory support as well. So the point is we DMA write into persistent memory packet file or named packet buffers. So the code is now that uh, the, the NetMap sub repository, so subtree. So the but we also have some local updates. So the you want you are interested in trying it out, so just let me know. Thanks. Or RDMA? What? Isn't it for RDMA? No, splice is arbitrary. You can take it. Up. Okay, with splice, you can take a socket or a file descriptor. Mm -hmm. uh, some combination of splice and MMAP, you might be able to get a lot of the same things without quite, be quite so invasive, but. 
But um, using Splice, uh, then the on imagine that pack receiving data, mm -hmm. then the, the how the how application gets chance to see data whether to actually keep or not. Right. I w it would be more like if you could, it maybe like AF packet and and steering or something um, might be a way. I mean, I'm just trying to think of doing the same thing without trying to get as invasive a set of patches mm -hmm. in. Like NetMap is never going to go in, so let's. Um, you know, can we go? F can we get something similar without going? Okay. Quite as far. That's that's basically what I'm thinking. Um, okay. um, you know, it's like the point is the way I view this is this is research pushing the envelope, proving a point, mm -hmm. and to get from there to what shows up in a production environment, mm -hmm. we have to iterate over a couple iterations of something similar. Mm -hmm. Thank you.